Is screen is screen visible? Am I audible properly? Yes, sir, both. Sir. Both. OK, so let's just start with summary and then further go ahead with it. OK, so yesterday we came up with the concept. I mean, first we actually did Lagrange theorem and uh, which was important theorem for uh, group theory. But then we came up with this idea of the normal subgroup, which also emanates from the left and the right cosets, which is that a group is called to be a normal a subgroup is called to be a normal subgroup if the le left cosets are same as the right cosets for all x's, right? And then we of course discussed about the classes, which is another way of looking at the group. Now, not from the point of view of the subgroups and then forming cosets from that, but from the point of view of the conjugation. So it's these are also called conjugacy classes. So X is conjugate to Y if there exist group element A such that A inverse X A is equal to Y. Of course, all A, X and Y belongs to group. And then we see that we can make basically we can partition the group into distinct classes and each class will have the elements which will be a non overlapping one. Identity element makes a class of its own and hence classes in general don't form subgroups except for the trivial one. Then the next part which I actually asked you to do as a homework that please figure out if H is a subgroup then so if H is a subgroup then X inverse H X or G inverse H G does this form a subgroup. Did you try to check it? Yes, sir, it formed. OK, you have got it. OK, so in general what happens that H and X inverse H X, they do not need to be same. However, for a normal subgroup, both of these are basically same. So that means that the normal subgroups are those subgroups where this subgroup H is containing all the elements which are contained in X inverse H X, basically that. So another way of looking at the normal subgroup. But once we come up with the idea of the normal subgroup, we also come up with this different style of forming the elements, which we call as the cosets. So we, we form all possible distinct cosets of normal subgroup of the group G, and we find under coset multiplication. So, so under coset multiplication, which we also define, so coset composition or multiplication. So under coset composition or multiplication, that also forms a group which we call as a factor group and the order of the factor group is nothing but the ratio of the group or ratio of the order of the group to the order of the normal subgroup. So cosets and classes give us idea of the normal subgroup and normal subgroups can be used to form factor groups. We also did direct product of groups in between where I showed that if we have two groups in which only one element is column uh, common, that is the identity element. And if no other element is common. Further, if AB is equal to BA, that is the abelian structure is there, then we can form, we can enlarge the group by multiplying the individual elements of the group. So that was the way of enlarging our uh, groups, which is what we call as the direct product of groups. Z4 is given as Z2 into Z2. We can find out a structure of Z6, for example, by doing this Z2 into Z3, so on and so forth. And lastly, I, we was discussing or we were discussing homomorphism or the group homomorphism where now we are. I mean, again, it's an important concept that if we have an abstract group G star and we have another group which is G prime dot, then there exists a homomorphism, which is let's say phi if phi obeys what is written on the first line, which is phi G1 star G2 is equal to phi g1 composition phi g2 and then we uh, did a question for many to one uh, at least four we did two to one homomorphism for a group having one minus one i minus one i and the multiplication going to one minus one and then i gave a question which was there on the previous page so did somebody try to do that question first part and the second part yes, sir. yes, sir. yes what sir. did you get Sir, homomorphism for first case, uh, but second case is not. 
second year is not absolutely right and actually i mean it was clear to you that in the second case so what was the identity element on the left hand side group g zero, zero. what is the identity element on the right hand side one one so if zero is not mapped on to one which means that the identity element of g must be ma mapped to identity element of g prime if that is not happening that itself tells you that this is not going to be a homomorphism or group homomorphism yeah so if you look into the part 2 minus 1 when n being even which means that zero will fall here where minus 1 is not the identity element so it is not going to be group homomorphism so thinking about group homomorphism is about actually also thinking about how the identity element uh, gets mapped okay i still wanted to do one more example uh, because it's an important one before we make a transition now this one is also a simple one so let's say we have a group which i call g l n r does somebody remember what is this group we did long back so this is general linear group of real matrices invertible of dimension n cross m so surely i mean this is a group under matrix multiplication remember these are the invertible matrices which we are talking about and the entries are all real yeah so this is what it is so let's now let's now think about the other uh, group g prime which is a simple one r star what is r star r minus 0 number right. minus 0 so, uh, so r minus this zero element under ordinary multiplication simple multiplication this forms group yeah it was a zero element which was causing us trouble now it is no longer there so this also forms a group if i define phi which is a map from group g to g dash such that phi of a so a is nothing but a matrix of this kind is given as determinant of a remember determinant of a matrix is a single number and since real matrix so it, it will be having a real determinant yeah so this will form this one so will this mapping where we are using phi a is equal to determinant a is it a group homomorphism or not so again we are doing something that we have matrices n cross n invertible of course on one side and we have just a number the determinant of this matrix so if a is this some matrix whatever item then the other side is just the determinant of a which means a real number nothing else is this going to so how are you going to proceed you are going to check again the same thing yeah so you do need to check again the same thing whether phi a dot b where let's say i'm just defining dot for this one or you can say when I mean, this is a matrix multiplication is equal to phi a times phi b which is nothing but is the determinant of a b same as determinant of a times determinant of b yes no yes sir yeah i mean you have done that portion even you have done it for the trace whether trace of uh, a times b is equal to trace of a into trace of b is it or trace of a plus trace of b multiply multiply yeah but you understand that this homomorphism is giving me one interesting feature that if i have group of any kind on one side then i can map it into a group which is very different group from the previous one so there exist maps it is just like a maps in the real functions of for example of real variables let's say fx you can write down any function 
even though it is different from x, but you are actually creating a function. So homomorphism is very useful concept in growth, and we are going to use it in representation theory, except that what we are going to use is what is called this at times, but then most of the time it will be group homomorphism. Now we come up with this concept of the group isomorphism. Now what will be group isomorphism? What is the definition of isomorphism? Can somebody tell? Whatever, forget about group theory otherwise. I'm waiting to hear, I'm just writing something and I will discuss it later. But anybody who can say what is isomorphism? For functions? Sir, one to one mapping. One to one mapping is how do you define one to one mapping? It's a. See, mapping is defined as what? It is defined as injective, surjective, so one to one, onto, and then it is bijective, that is, there is one to one correspondence. And there is something interesting about that. Homomorphism, which is bijective also. Right. Excellent. So we'll just going to discuss that. Very good. So what we need basically now what we are thinking of in terms of the concept is it is pretty simple. In terms of the concept, it is this. Let's consider that there exists an element G or oh sorry, a small G of group G. And we get by this guy, which is nothing but a map, something called phi G. Yeah, so that case phi G1 is equal to phi G2. If that happens, then that means that G1 is equal to G2. That means that there exists one to one correspondence between the points on the left G and the right G prime. So for each element, there exists a unique element on the right. So whether you talk about going from G to G prime, or you can even talk about going from G prime to G. Both are basically same. So if phi is group homomorphism and phi is bijective, by the way, I would request you please go back and look into the definition because I generally like the technical ones which is nothing but one to one and on to. And somebody may say actually uh, injective and surjective. If two of these properties are met, if phi is a group homomorphism and phi is bijective. So that's the second property. So that there will be one to one correspondence. No many to one, one to one correspondence between the two groups. In that case, we call the group homomorphism as the group isomorphism. In fact, if group isomorphism exists, if group isomorphism exists, then there also exists this phi inverse. Does phi inverse also need to exist for group homomorphism? Concept is coming mainly from the function theory. It has nothing to from, from with groups only. Does phi inverse or is phi inverse mandatorily existing for group homomorphism also? The bijective should be there for uh, inverse. Right. So one can think about it this way. Let's say two elements. So let's say two to one map. So two to one map. So let, which means that A and B maps onto the same element, let's say phi C. Now, if you want to create, let, so phi of A, that is going to give you phi of C basically, and phi of B, that is also going to give you phi of C. Now, what will happen if I want like to invert it? I do not know which element it will go to, either to A or to B. That means that I cannot be sure on that. Whereas if there is a one to one correspondence, we are pretty sure that the elements are uniquely mapped with each other and all the elements are mapped. And hence we have no problem of going in the 
reverse direction as well. So we can think about the isomorphism in terms of both side mapping from G to G prime or from G prime to G, depending on whether we are talking about phi or whether we are talking about phi inverse. So isomorphism is one to one correspondence between the elements of the two groups, even though the groups may be entirely different. So this will always be true for isomorphism. Always homomorphism. Need to check if it is. Isomorphism or not. So unless second condition is marked true, phi is bijective, you cannot figure out whether phi inverse exists or not. But if phi is bijective, then it will surely have its inverse. OK, I'll invite questions at this point. If not, then why group isomorphism is so interesting? Isomorphism is so interesting because isomorphic groups. They these guys have same. Mathematical structure. What is meant by mathematical structure I will come to. Even though. The groups. May differ. In. Nature. Of. Elements. Or. In combination laws or composition laws. So. Isomorphic groups have same mathematical structure, even though the groups may differ in nature of elements or the composition laws. Let's have an example first and then try to figure out what we have written. So let's say G under cross. So this is G cross one group. Another group I choose G prime. And this G prime is under composition. And what is this group? This group is a group having E R R square R cube. So what kind of group is this? Cyclic. Cyclic. This is a cyclic group. Can you just tell me if you can relate it with some real thing? I mean, whatever you have uh, read up to now. Something which we have already done. Where she? Right, this is something what you can relate to that rotations. In. Square. So R 90 degree, then R square will be. 180 degree will be. 270 degree 270. and R4 ultimately zero or 360 degree rotation. So that forms a group. Now that forms a group under composition. So you will apply your rotation on a figure and then you will apply a rotation on a figure. So the two groups, if you look into the left hand side and the right hand side, they look completely different in terms of what they are supposed to do. One is pure number, complex number under multiplication, fourth uh, root of unity. Another is it is rotations, which is to do with the symmetry operations above the square. If you make the Kelly multiplication table for these two guys. If you make this Kelly multiplication table for these two guys, I minus I, 1 minus 1, I minus I. And then the same for this guy. You will find out that the structure which is there on the two sides, they will look almost same if, if, I identify my R element, for example, which is rotation by 90 degree with either I or minus I of this left group. So on the left, I have four elements, one minus one, I minus one, I. If you just identify R with this element I, you will find all the other elements will come here 
so r square will become what if r is equal to i then r square will become minus 1 minus 1 r what one. minus 1 right and what will be r cube minus i minus i, I. Yes, excellent so now of course you can write down the same here you do not need to form any table now for this e r r square r cube if you have a table made for this guy all you need to do is to just define i was my r minus 1 is nothing but r square sorry and minus i is nothing but r cube and of course this guy is element identity and you will find that they have the same mathematical structure i do not need to figure out what will be the kelly's multiplication table on the left hand side or the right hand side once i know so this is a very good point because now all i need to figure out if there exist group isomorphism between the two kind of groups if so then all i need to do do i need do i know any group which i have solved if i have then whatever group with whatever abstract element you give to me whatever composition law you give to me i can tell you what will be the table for that kelly's kelly's multiplication table for that so i do not need to study so many groups in isolation right now the z4 group had two structures which we which is what we found z cube group has one structure which is what we found that if z cube group z3 group has only one structure then it doesn't matter whether it is z3 i write or cube root of unity i write because cube root of unity there will be three roots and there will be only three elements if it forms a group there is only one structure which is possible what will be that structure cyclic structure cyclic structure or the abelian structure whatever you call that but you already know the structure of any group with three elements whatever i tell you the group is if i tell you it is a group with three elements you say sir due to isomorphism i know that there exist only one possibility for any other group on the other end you i say sir there are four elements in a group then you will say sir then i will have to just check if it is a cyclic group or if it is a z2 into z2 kind of a group a square equal to e b square equal to e c square equal to e once i check that i am done because i know which group i need to correspond to i have already read my 1 minus 1 i minus i hence group isomorphism allows you to study very very abstract groups with very complex composition laws in a very straightforward and simple manner in fact group isomorphism also tells us that if g and g prime are isomorphic then if this g is abelian then the g prime has to be abelian because they have to maintain the same structure if g is cyclic sorry not cyclic but cyclic then correspondingly this is cyclic or vice versa from g prime to g because there exists if there exists this guy then there exists this phi inverse guy also so group isomorphism is a very powerful way of studying group structures because now i do not need to worry about too many groups which are existing all i need to know how many group structures exist and which group structure is isomorphic to each one that's it nothing beyond that okay questions i will invite sir group isomorphism uh, implies abelian and cyclic both in no group isomorphism says that if g if if g is abelian then g prime is also abelian that is what it means it does not mean that the group has to be abelian all, always it can it can be a non abelian group but it can is hey, isomorphism is independent of abelian but once you find out that the two groups are isomorphic and one of the group is abelian then the corresponding isomorphic group must be abelian it is just that got my point yes sir so i uh, so i have just written for the completeness if this then this and vice versa also because of this phi inverse okay so where am i going to go next 
what I have already done is what is called the part of the group theory, which several of you have already studied in uh, undergraduate or at the undergraduate level also. What we are going to do next is something which we haven't done at the undergraduate level. Most likely, I do not know, some of you might have done it, even that. Fine. So what we are going to do is group theory shakes hands with linear vector space. So our unit four shakes hands with unit one, and this is what is called the representation theory. Now, of course, you will have to fasten your seatbelt because I mean, of the limited time, we will be going through the concepts mostly wherever possible. I will continue to give you examples, but I do need to cover a little bit of that. Anyway, wherever you are not able to understand, you will just ask questions, right? So we are going to have this group theory shaking hand with LVS. Why it will be interesting? There's something which will be interesting, which will come in the linear vector space. Let me just first tell you, and then it will uh, make sense. So set of, so this is concept number one, set of invertible, invertible, Linear operators, let's say T, set of invertible linear operators form group under operator composition. Now, this is point one. We are trying to understand concepts first. So remember what is a linear operator? Linear operator, first of all, it is an operator. So that means that it is going to operate on a vector in linear vector space. So this is something which we now need to remember. That is why I do not want to do group theory before this one. So generally what means, so linear operator operates on this vector. This vector belongs to some linear vector space. So remember the definition. So this was some V over vector space over some field. It can have dimensions depending on if it is a finite group. Yeah. And this guy is linear operator. What is meant by linear operator? Now we have done many times. What is meant by linear operator? Sir, it will return the vector in the same vector space. So linear portion has something else, but the operator, we are not using the word linear operation or in general linear transformation, we are using the word linear operator. So in general, linear operators are the operators which return the vectors in the same vector space. Although I can actually expand this portion, I can even do it for linear transformation. But since we restrict ourselves to linear operators, let's just do the linear operators. But what is the linearity portion? Okay, operators which return vector in the same vector space. So T phi will be another vector, let's say psi in the same vector space, let's say. So this is linear operator. Okay. And what is the linearity portion? Sir, additivity and homogeneity. Additivity and homogeneity. Excellent. So remember that this is what it is, except that I am just going to add one more thing that if the exists t1 t2 composition acting on phi then what does that mean that t2 first acts on phi it returns let's say chi and then t1 acts on this guy and this will return another one let's say zeta so equal to which again belongs to my vector space all right so the composition of the two operators are defined like that and you can call it product of the operators also. It, is, it doesn't matter as long as you understand the concept. So what have I written? Set of invertible linear oper operators form group under operator composition. I cannot delink it from linear vector space. So this on some linear vector space because operators dangling operators don't work well, whether it is C or whether it is quantum mechanics. OK. So once we know that, so let's just try to prove it. Is it so or not? So closure, if T1 is a linear operator, T2 is a linear operator, 
what would you say about T1, T2? Is it a linear operator? Is it going to operate on a vector and gives returns a vector in the space or not? Yes, sir. Yes, so yes. this is also a linear operator. So T1 dot T2 will also be a linear operator. In fact, you have used that. I mean, I do not know in quantum mechanics, you have been using it like anything. X time P, the next time P plus P times X, and you are forming all kind of formation products out of that also. Yeah, it's yes. just that I'm explicitly writing. Good. One, what about identity? Here, is there any identity? which leaves the vector just like that. So if I apply something on this and I get only this, is there any operator like that? Identity operator. Right, identity operator does exactly this purpose. So identity operator is the operator which will leave my vector unchanged. Okay, what? And then you can do the composition law with this also. So T I, what will be the return of this? It will be only T cap A. T, which is same as uh, I cap. Yeah, OK. What about the inverse? That by default, I mean, I, I defined set of invertible linear operators, right? So each of these T will have their own inverses such that whether this guy, what this guy is going to give you? Identity. I. Identity, which is identity. what the group, uh, group requires that it should return identity. Good. And what is the next one, which is? And that is, of course. It doesn't matter. I mean, this guy remains like this all the time, as long as, I mean, whether you put it here or you put it here. So it doesn't matter the which you are going to first compose and then do the next composition. Yeah, so that means that all the group properties are obeyed by this set. Now, this is something which we, we have done in the linear vector space. Now, this is concept number one. What was what is concept number two, which is required is what I have already done. What is group homomorphism? Now I would request you to give me the definition. So phi from G to G prime. OK, let's say G star to G. What is group homomorphism? Phi uh, A star B is equal to phi A dot phi. Phi A star B is equal to phi A dot phi B, which we have just done many times now. So these two concepts are the key for representation theory. Now, what am I going to write uh, right next? That is, I'm going to write something which I have done in part one and part two. So, so let me just write. Can somebody guess what am I going to write? No, yeah. What am I going to write next? We have started with representation. What do you think we are going to do next? So one can map an arbitrary group G to a group of invertible linear operators in linear vector space. This is what we are going to do in this part. And this is the part which is very relevant to quantum mechanics. This is the part which is very relevant to nuclear physics, a part very relevant to particle physics, part very relevant to crystallography, part very relevant to solid state. I mean, so many of those uh, fields. But what we are trying to do is a very simple application of a group theory. That there exists, let's say, some abstract group which may be just some symmetry uh, with this, so that there exist elements, G1, G2, G3, so on and so forth. I can map it using some transformation. Now I'm just calling this map as 
define is as D such that I am writing my DG. OK, this is my map. And I am going to write this map this D of G1, D of G2, D of G3, so on and so forth such that D from G to DG or D of G1 is star G2 is equal to D of G1 is D of G2. That means that I am not talking of any general map. I am talking about group homomorphism from one set of any arbitrary group to my set of linear operators under composition. So this is what I am doing in the representation theory. So what we are saying is operator group DG is a representation of the group G in a linear vector space V of F. So this is what the word representation mean. When I am saying that I am starting with this representation theory, I am using the concept one that there is something what is called group homomorphism and two set of invertible operators form a group on its own in a linear vector space. So instead of studying any group, I am going to study set of invertible linear operators. I will invite questions here. Can you repeat the last line? Oh, the one which I have written here basically. So yes. instead of instead of studying my group G star, right? I will study my DG. DG is what? Group of operators. So D is a map which will take el every element of my G1, G2, G3 into, into the operator. So DG1 will be an operator, DG2 will be an operator, DG3 will be an operator, and all of these guys will be doing some composition. So it's a group homomorphism from an abstract group to the group of invertible operators. So what is that operator then doing? This operator is just a representation of the original group G star, right? I mean, we have read it in the homomorphism. Yeah, so, so go ahead, ask question. Need for doing this. Ah, this is the question which I was looking at. I'm, I'm so happy that somebody asked this question. Oh, what have I achieved here? I mean, OK, there will be a physics need which I will discuss. But at this point of time, I will just ask you something and then you might start understanding this. So good question. What's the need? So need will be answered in two steps and the first stop step comes here. If we define a basis. Yeah, let's say orthonormal. Phi I. Let's say if we define a basis. In linear vector space, so let's say it's n dimensional finite. Okay. How do you represent operator in a, in Arno in the orthonormal basis? Can you answer this question from your uh, linear vector space understanding? If there is a basis, if we choose a basis in a linear vector space, that means we are talking about the finite group. Let's say it's an n dimensional group. So there will be n such phi i, i is equal to 1, 2, 3, n. So then how do you represent an operator? Does somebody remember that? How do you represent a linear operator? In the a basis. Matrix, where the first element is phi 1, 1. Right. Written in terms of columns. Right. Yes. So let's just remember that. So T acting on phi 1, just, it is just a revisiting what we did long back. So this will be alpha 1, 1, phi 1 plus alpha 1, 2, phi 2 plus so on and so forth. Alpha 1, n, phi n, right? And then well, T acting on, let's say, phi 2, just 
phi n and then this, but that this is this interesting thing that in this basis, so let's call this basis, the T is represented by just like the way you said, alpha 1 1, alpha 1 2, so on and so forth, alpha 2 1, alpha 2 2, so on and so forth. So we are basically doing it column wise, alpha n 1, alpha n 2, so on and so forth. But remembering that this guy is uh, orthonormal basis. What is alpha 1 1? 1. It won't be 1. And five it one. will be phi 1 comma t phi 1, which in your quantum mechanics class you are writing as phi 1 bracket notation. Yeah, phi 1. What is your alpha 1 2? Zero. No, it won't be zero. Right. It will be zero in some particular basis, but yeah, I mean, somebody's saying that. So if you just operate phi 2 from the left hand side, T phi 1, then this is what you what is alpha 1 two, and so on and so forth and the here, so on and so forth. So what is more important? What is more important is that you are representing your operators by a matrix or let's say if it is an n dimensional basis or uh, linear vector space, then it is n cross n, the dimension of this matrix. So now comes this interesting point, even though I have given you the concept there in the pre uh, previous page, on the previous page, that representation is nothing but identifying group elements by the corresponding operators, the real power of it lies in the this guy. The, Okay, now, since operators are represented by matrices in finite and dimensional linear vector space, okay, V and F, hence for finite dimensional space or LVS, this D, which is doing what? A group homomorphism from group G star to, remember, what group we are going to now? D of G under AG. composition. What will this guy become? In the case of finite and dimensional linear vector space, if we select a basis. So the set of linear invertible operators under composition, each one of that operator will be represented by. Each one of the operator will be represented by. Operator in n dimensional linear vector space how is it represented said by matrix by a matrix so each one of the individual operator will be represented by a matrix so what we are talking about in the n dimensional linear vector space the representation which we were discussing about it is nothing but general linear group of invertible matrices with possibly complex entries. So the same representation theory, which I wrote as some abstract representation, now has this interesting touch that what we are doing, if we are talking about the finite dimensional linear vector spaces, then it is about taking an abstract group and converting it or representing it by a group of matrices under what? This composition, which was T1, T2. If you have this T1S and T2S, both of which are matrices. So how will you show your composition? It will be nothing but? Multiplication. Matrix multiplication. Multiplic under matrix multiplication. So 
let's just think about it. What I have said, what I have said is that we are talking about in the representation theory, we are talking about a homomorphism D, which will take us from any abstract group to the N cross N invertible matrices under matrix multiplication. So I do not need to now remember that how rotations will compose itself. I, I need to just remember the laws of matrix multiplication. And if I remember the laws of my matrix multiplication, I will be able to do take care of it. So that means that each of the operator which I was saying is nothing but a matrix. Yeah. So can you think about what will be the representation of this identity element then in terms of a matrix? Identity Which matrix. Identity matrix. Identity, see identity matrix, something like this. Right. In fact, what we say was what we were doing as G1 is star G2. It will be nothing but DG1 times now DG2 where DG1 is one matrix. DG2 is another matrix. So we are going to just multiply two matrices. And since group homomorphism hold, holds true, so I now do not need to remember how this G1 is composing with G2. Forget about that. I only need to think about how the matrices multiply and I am just fine with it. And how each of this matrix will be represented. Each of the matrix will be represented in the manner in which you have just defined it. Phi 1 T of Phi 1. So let me just write down that also and then I will again invite questions. So each of this matrix. So for example, DG, if I have to think about all I have to think about a matrix in some basis, of course. And I will say Phi 1 comma D G acting on Phi 1. What was the next element? Oh. Phi 2. Yeah, so please look into it. I mean, we use this Phi 2 comma T Phi 1. So that will become what? This will become Phi 2 D G Phi 1, so on and so forth. So D I J of G is nothing but phi i times d of g acting on phi j or in my notation which I have used in mathematical physics class this is basically this. In of course orthonormal basis. So now this is at this point I will just take a halt and I will just tell you few things and then uh, OK we may decide further. So those guys who are in mathematics field who are not in let's say physics field for them representation is always about matrix representation they do not care that there exist some operators that there care exist some linear vectors they say okay i mean you are talking about the representation so we know what it is it is nothing but representation of any abstract group in terms of matrices group and I have to only worry about the matrix multiplication, although it will have implications, but I need to only worry about the matrix implement matrix multiplication. And this is what the representation theory is. But those guys who are in physics, although I could have avoided everything and did not. I mean, I could have avoided writing uh, the first portion, which is an abstract portion saying that abstract group is represented by group of invertible linear operators. I could have given you this definition directly that we are just you going to use matrices to represent those group elements so that the composition will be nothing but the matrix multiplication. But the abstract point for the physics is that we are actually representing group elements by the operators so that we do not need to only think about in terms of these finite dimensional. We can actually take it to the infinite dimensional also. And once we understand that we will be able to use certain symmetry operations. For example, think about it. Parity of operation parity does anybody know what does parity operation do parity operation so it works as a reflection like p of x changes so to p if of i am uh, acting my p phi on x then what will it become phi of phi minus, minus x. x i mean this is something let's say this is my parity operation not the projection so i i must write parity since uh, this and several guys write pi I mean but then several guys write pi for projection okay who cares so okay is phi x the eigenvalue uh, eigenfunction of this p operator 
Yes, sir. How? I mean, P phi x is not returning phi x. Sir, if uh, so we can apply it once out. more. Yeah, so let's just apply it. OK, P composition P phi x. This gives you P acting on phi minus x and then phi x. So you will say that P square operator is identity operator, right? Idempotent. If you apply it twice, that it is going to return this i. Interesting. Yeah, good. But phi x, is this the eigenfunction of p? Okay, you will say phi x is the eigenfunction of p squared. What about the eigenfunction of p? So at this point That's of time, you will say, sir, tell me if the function is even or odd. Yes. Okay, sir. Let's say, let's say I say that the function is even and I applied p of phi x which will become phi minus x by definition. But since it's an even function, so what will happen? Phi minus x is same as? Phi x. Phi x. Now is this, uh, is this phi x an eigenfunction now? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Very good. Uh, very good. And uh, eigenvalue is? One. 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 Okay, one. let's do the same thing now quickly for odd one. Okay, I mean those who do not like or who Minus, minus I using this. So phi 2, I mean, I'm just come saying something which is important. So minus phi 2x. Now, phi 2x is the eigenfunction of p with the eigenvalue minus 1. So your phi x is surely not an eigenfunction of p, but if phi x is even or odd, then it will eigenfunction of the parity operator. Now look into something which is coming so naturally. If I think about a general phi x, can I write it in terms of even and odd functions? Can I write my general phi x in terms of even phi functions and odd functions? Can I construct that? OK, so think about that. But the second thing which I would like you to think is that suddenly you are thinking about two operators. See P square and this P square is nothing but identity. So suddenly you have started thinking about, OK, I mean, I seem to be getting two operators. Let's say P and T square. P square is going to give me identity. So I can think about a group now, which is going to work exactly in the manner in which group works. You will see that. And suddenly I think about applying this parity operation on phi x as nothing but a group of two elements getting applied on phi x. And if I start thinking in that direction, I will find out that the parity operator, I do not need to worry too much about its structure. I will be able to know it once I know how a two member group functions on this phi x. If I know that, I do not need to study parity operator in isolation. In fact, I can make a similarity charge conjugation, for example, that if something changes the charges, yeah, if something changes the time operation, reverses the time, let's say time is moving forward. So every time I can think about an operation which on application twice, it returns back the same thing. I can think about the group theory now. Why should I worry about those, what individual operation is doing? I know that if such operations exist, then I can just invoke my group theory of two elements and I just see what I can do with two elements and everything whatever I am doing with these two I can apply it anywhere else. So parity operation in the case of physics whether it is classical quantum wherever you want to apply this is a very nice and a simple application of the group theory in terms of I mean group theory in practice. We are going to do something of course we are going to but that is the idea behind this transformation that we have started thinking about operators and the symmetry these operators enjoy. If the operators have certain symmetry, that means that if it leaves our original function, I mean, uh, invariant, if this uh, converts it into minus of that, it does something uh, interesting with that. So those things we do not now need to study separately and individually. We can study it in terms of the group getting applied on a linear vector space. Yeah. So this is the main motivation that you can enjoy symmetry operations now acting on the linear vector space vectors in terms of a group of operators 
acting on a linear vector space. And since I know so many things regarding group, an abelian group, it does something, non-abelian group, it does something else, cyclic group, it does something, so on and so forth. And uh, prime groups will have only one possibility, I mean, one or uh, G, uh, that it will be a cyclic group. Those things I can just take directly from the group theory. So that's the idea. Okay, I exceeded my time, sorry. Questions here, if you want to ask, but I will build on this. We are going to apply it, and hence uh, it will be slightly more than that. So we will see it in action. For my sake, I just wanted to write this. Can somebody help me writing this guy? So if dij individual group element is written like this, can somebody tell me how this dij g1 into g2 will look like? So composition of this. Sir, so phi i d phi, phi, phi is d, right? Oh, you are writing okay, phi i, okay, good. D, G1, phi j. G1, G2, phi j, which, which you will find that we can write as, you will find, we can write as D i k G1 times D k j G2 or, I mean, something which we'll do tomorrow. So let's not do it today. Yeah, it's exhausted. Questions, I mean, some questions if you, do, you, if you have on the concept behind the group theory. So no, why it is D G1, G2 and not D G1, D G2? Oh, I mean, I can actually, uh, once you know it is a group homomorphism, right? Once you know it is a group homomorphism, your D G1 star G2 is what? D G1 times D G2. D G2, yes, sir. Yeah, so you can write it like this or, or you can like, I mean, this is what I was planning to just do. Uh, but it is looking very messy here that it is nothing but phi d g1 acting on let's say so you get phi i so you think about phi k and then phi k d g2 acting on phi j so i will do this tomorrow but i will just write it because this is coming naturally from group homomorphism yeah so the product of the two, my point was this, G1 star G2, if you have to think about what will be the corresponding element matrices wise, it will be nothing but the product of the two matrices, basically, the elements of the two matrices, the way it gets multiplied. So you are right, as long as you remember, this is what I need from you guys, right, that this is a group homomorphism that we are applying here, so that will become good. Anything else? So, sir, um, uh, we are doing this representation because we want our group to represent in uh, in an operator group, which will help us to go, get into quantum mechanics, doing commute, uh, commutating things, measuring probability, etc. So, yes, uh, there are two things which is happening. Two things simultaneously. First, the right side of the group, hai, jo DG1 wale groups, hai, they are matrices, right? Yes, sir. Matrix multiplication is a very simple thing which you can do anytime, right? Yes, sir. You can make programs, you can do whatever. So if you are dealing only with the matrices, let's say, then it is very easy to work with, right? Because you know yes. how to multiply matrices. You do not need to think about, okay, if R1, R2 pe apply, then you remember how you have equilateral triangle. Wala kaise kiya hoga? Pehle aap A ko B, banate hoge, B ko C, banate yes, hoge, yes. And then, then you were applying something. You do not need to worry about that. If you have an operator, if you have a group of matrices which represent that, you see that I multiply it and see the result. Aega. Right? This is uh, something which you do in rotation also. I do not know if you remember. When you take rotation and x vector, x prime vector, in your 2D plane, then one case is that you are taking all the projections and working on them. एक दूसरा केस है आप r थीटा बताओ cos थीटा cos थीटा डायगोनल टर्म minus sin थीटा sin थीटा ऑफ डायगोनल टर्म एंड यू जस्ट कीप ऑन मल्टीप्लाइंग इट विद x एंड y तो जितनी भी रोटेशन आपको मैं दूंगा आप कहोगे सर पहली रोटेशन से r थीटा 1 टाइम्स x हो गया दूसरी रोटेशन से मतलब r थीटा 1 टाइम्स x r वेक्टर दूसरी रोटेशन से r थीटा 2 इज एक्टिंग ऑन दिस वेक्टर सो आई विल कीप ऑन मल्टीप्लाइंग माय मैट्रिसेस यू गेट द पॉइंट नो यस आई गॉट इट yeah, so this is something like this. So if I ask you, pehle ek theta one se yahan pauncha bhai, hamara vector, r se r prime. And then is se theta two se yahan pauncha. And ye ban gaya r vector. To aap kis tarikhe se solve karoge? To aap kis kai tarikhe se solve karne ke, par agar aapne ise r theta one ke term mein likhna shuru kar diya, 
which is what the rotation matrix look like then aapke liye bada simple hai you will apply r theta 1 on your r vector which is nothing but x and y so it is a two dimensional and then you will apply r theta 2 on this and in fact if you remember that r theta 2 in composition r theta 1 is nothing but cos theta 1 plus theta 2 and minus sin of blah 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 then it will be even easier right i ek bar mein aap pura apply kar sakte ho aur agar aap projection lena shuru ho jao iske ye aise karenge to it will take a lot of time so something agar main aap se kahun aap mujhe de do bhai r inverse of theta 2 तो आप कहो ओके नो डू नॉट डू दैट बिकॉज इतने सारे प्रोजेक्शन लेना आई मीन इट डजेंट लुक राइट बट हेयर इन द ग्रुप थ्योरी यू नो आर इनवर्स थिएटर टू क्या है इट इज नथिंग बट 360 डिग्री माइनस ऑफ थिएटर टू सो यू नो व्हाट टू राइट इन द मैट्रिक्स एंड यू विल इमीडिएटली गिव मी द रिजल्ट सो एप्लीकेशन ऑफ द ग्रुप थ्योरी इन दिस केस व्हिच इज नथिंग बट एंजॉयिंग सर्टेन सिमेट्री प्रॉपर्टीज दैट थिंग इज हेल्पिंग यू आउट इनफैक्ट यू नो फ्रॉम द ग्रुप थ्योरी इटसेल्फ दैट व्हाट आर द अदर थिंग्स yeah mere khayal se exhaust ho chuke ho aap and i but I, i hope you get my point that you can do that that is one which is matrix multiplication second point is just like i showed in the case of your parity operation which is a famous one of the operators i mean you have read it now to is operator se kis tarike se mere wave functions affect honge whether my parity will be a good operator or not in certain interactions strong interaction hai electromagnetic weak Uh, and then strong electromagnetic weak and strong electromagnetic weak and gravitational gravitation four interaction fundamental interaction you have read it in your modern physics i guess long back so uh, those interaction how those guys are affected yeah so aapko ye sari cheeze group theory mein naturally inbuilt mil jati hain धीरे धीरे जैसे जैसे आगे बढ़ते हैं देखते हैं उससे कुछ और मिलता है हम लोगों को है ना तो दो चीजें आपको पता चलेगी एक मैट्रिक्स मल्टीप्लिकेशन करना ज्यादा आसान है हमारे लिए दूसरा इससे कुछ फिजिक्स के ऑपरेटर्स का जो सिमिट्री होगी उसको हम यूटिलाइज ज्यादा एफिशिएंटली कर पाएंगे नोइंग द ग्रुप स्ट्रक्चर्स क्योंकि हमें ग्रुप स्ट्रक्चर्स का अंडरस्टैंडिंग है ओके सर थैंक यू ओके गुड गुड एनीबडी एल्स या दिस वाज मोर ऑफ द कांसेप्ट यस यस गो अहेड sir uh, can you explain the example of uh, isomorph isomorphs that having the same mathematical structure i didn't understand that example oh oh that's a simple one that you should do i mean okay let me just give it as a homework and then you do that and then you will come back to me report to me tomorrow so let me just ask you to do something very simple it's a very simple homework but please do it those of you e r r square r cube this is under this so rotations of square this forms a group so this is g1 yeah form g2 our famous group 1 minus 1 i minus i under this so question make a multiplication table which means scales multiplication table right that you can do sure yes yes no no yes Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. At times, I mean, I am unable to see your faces, and you are exhausted. I am exhausted, so I just thought. And then, just do this. Just do this. In the second multiplication table, second multiplication table. If you represent i, i, which is there. If you represent your i by r, fine. Minus i by r cube, and So minus i by r cube and minus one by r square. So, केवल एक छोटा सा आप ये करोगे कि मैं i की जगह आंखें बंद करूँगा जहाँ जहाँ i लिखा है वहाँ पे मैं r लिख दूँगा जहाँ जहाँ minus i लिखा है वहाँ r cube लिख दूँगा और जहाँ जहाँ minus one लिखा है I will put r square. Are you getting the same multiplication table which you have got here or not? If you have got that, then all you need to know. if there exist group isomorphism then i do not need to make separate kelis table for each individual four member group and i can just make it once i make the correlation and after that correlation i am done with it i do not need to make another one for the g2 another one for the g3 any four member group this will be done as long as the group is cyclic it will be done you got this point 
Ajay? No? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you, you do that as a homework, figure out if you are getting. And if the mathematical, see, remember, if the Calais table is same, then it doesn't matter what you are writing on the ABC, right? I mean, you write ABC, A R R R square, E uh, 1 minus 1, or whatever you write. If the table remains same, what, what is important here? That how did I know this guy? Yeah. Or somehow if you can know this guy. Sir, you are saying that draw the multiplication table for the group 1 minus 1, I O T N minus I O T N, then put the values uh, in so instead of. These values means e. what? Yeah, put the values means this. So you have made this like this. Yes, sir. A bit slowly. You have made this, right? Thanks, and, sir. And then you will have 1 minus 1, I minus 1 here. Yes, sir. So you just check if without looking at anything else, without looking at anything else. If you just change every one by E, every I by R, every minus one by R square and every minus I by R cube, do not make the table. Just change it. Just change. Are you getting the same table which you were getting on this, which was a very different group under very different composition? I mean, that was not multiplication, right? Are you getting the same table or not? If you are getting the same table, that means you did not need to actually write down anything for this guy. All you had to do was to write a table for G2 and remembering that there is an isomorphism between G1 and G2. Hence, the table will look identical with just the replacement of the elements without actually multiplying or composing anything. So isomorphism gives you this power. Yes, sir, got it. OK, OK, good. So DSC was a paper which was not studied by everybody even at the Delhi University, right? I mean, this is something that I understood from the group theory portion. Yes, yeah. sir, I didn't, I didn't study this group theory in my UG. Uh, the, uh, were you a student from Delhi University? Yes, sir, I am from Delhi University. OK, so OK, I mean, yeah, so there were several students who haven't studied group theory and unfortunately, I mean, whatever be the reason, the course when it was made, the mathematical physics course, the portion which I am now doing basically 